my name is Andrew Stewart. I'm a senior lecturer in neuroscience and experimental psychology at the University of Manchester. I'm a fellow of the SSI, and I currently act as the institutional lead for open and reproducible research uh, at the University of Manchester. So I sort of sit in the university's uh, open research strategy group, uh, sort of uh, work on policy, et cetera, with our vice president for research. Um, so today I want to give a bit of an overview, a bit of an introduction to the UK Reproducibility Network, UKRN. I want to focus primarily on the Big Research England project that they've recently uh, funded. Um, I want to talk about some of the other activity that the UKRN has been uh, involved in recently. Uh, so really, I just want to tell you a bit of the story. And like all good stories uh, in the 21st century, uh, it began with a tweet. So about three years ago, uh, Marcus Munafu at the University of Bristol sent out this tweet, um, basically asking people in the Twitter sphere if they're interested in engaging in this network that he was setting up of academics at all career levels uh, across all disciplines who were interested uh, in issues to do with reproducibility and replicability in research. And this tweet really came out in the middle of a broad set of conversations that were ongoing, not just within the UK, but globally, uh, about you know, a number of concerns that people were starting to have about not just the way research had you know, been conducted up to this point, but also about research culture, reward, recognition, basically the whole research endeavor and whether it was really it was really, you know, was it really working in the way that in the way we, we, we thought that it should. So lots of people replied to uh, Marcus's initial tweet. I think from Manchester, there are about five of us who got in touch with them. Many other uh, people at other institutions uh, got in touch with Marcus as well. So clearly there was a lot of interest in this network. Um, and this brought together uh, a bunch of like-minded individuals, probably you know, more early career researchers than mid or late career. Uh, and this allowed the UKRN really to come into existence. So it's officially launched in March uh, 2019, uh, providing the central home for people who are interested in issues around reproducibility and replicability. So I'm not going to get into sort of definitions in this, in this, in this, in this talk, but we kind of uh, have a broad idea of what these two things uh, actually mean. And a lot of these concerns really emerged as a result of you know, work by people like John Ioannidis, who, uh, you know, in that classic paper from 2005, um, you know, say that most scientific, uh, you know, publications are actually wrong. The world was full of failures to replicate. Um, industry was getting very frustrated by the fact that they were trying to commercialize a lot of academic research, but, you know, not only could they not commercialize it, they couldn't even uh, reproduce or replicate those original findings. So it appeared that there was a sort of fundamental bunch of issues, you know, lightly interconnected uh, issues that really um, kind of kind of questioned the way in which research and researchers were incentivized uh, was kind of was kind of not really not really working. So there was uh, three components to the UKRN. The uh, the steering group is made up of um, sort of five individuals at the moment, not just from psychology. Uh, Malcolm McLeod is a neuroscientist. Uh, Alex Collins uh, works in sort of uh, an environmental uh, technology uh, and Laura as um, uh, sort of anthropologist. So, you know, reasonably good, uh, you know, range of disciplines represented the student group on the advisory board, uh, including uh, John Climax from industry. So it's important to think to, you know, ensure we're not always just talking to ourselves as academics, we're actually making those connections with stakeholders, uh, you know, people who are also interested in the results of um, you know what academics actually actually find. So we've got the steering group, the advisory board, and then institutions who wanted to formally join the UKRN were asked to create a senior academic position, uh, reporting to the um, you know sort of provost for research or vice president of research or whatever, uh, in order to kind of uh, ensure that they had a commitment to the UKRN agenda, which was very much focused on changing research culture to improve. Uh, you know, reproducibility, replicability, rigor, rigor uh, in research. And you can see within a, about a year or so, 
20 institutions joined, um, a good spread of institutions across uh, England, Scotland and, and Wales. A few institutions are kind of, you know, obviously not there, um, but um, you know, more institutions are actually joining, joining every month. In addition to the institutional leads uh, who've got sort of formal roles at their institutions, there's also a whole range of local grassroots network leads. Uh, most institutions that have an institutional lead will also have a grassroots open research working group uh, led or coordinated rather by one of the local network leads. So, you know, this, this number grew very rapidly and it's up to about 62 at the moment. And I suspect actually this is probably uh, out of date already. Um, um, institutions are, are joining with uh, increasing sort of speed um, as a result of sort of, uh, you know, increased engagement with uh, issues around open research. Um, the UKRN really connects a lot of groups together. Um, you know, the last thing the UKRN wants to do is kind of do any uh, duplication of effort, reinvention of the wheel. Um, so the open research working groups are a core component within UKRN. Uh, reproducibility, uh, journal clubs, some of you might uh, be aware of, typically run by early career researchers. Um, the LEAF, um, you know, program for uh, environmentally sustainable lab practices, Octopus for the Rat Science Club, etc. So there's lots of uh, initiatives that are sort of uh, loosely connected to UKRN. Now, as with any uh, organisation, any sort of group of people, um, you can only sort of get so far uh, on the basis of uh, hoping that people will put their time in for free. Um, so as we recognise pretty early on, we have to make sure that this is not just, you know, requiring people, uh, you know, to engage in sort of goodwill, give up their time for free. Funding uh, was important to make sure that it was going to be sustainable in the long term. And initially the funding came uh, in drips and drabs from a variety of sources, some research councils shipped in, Cancer Research Welcome, Research England, UKRI, DISC, et cetera. Um, but it was you know, pretty quickly decided that this wasn't long-term sustainable. We didn't want to be going cap in hand to these funders every you know, nine months or so asking for funding. Um, so so uh, Marcus and the uh, steering group then sort of looked into sort of more substantive funding that might be available at the UKRN and um, were directed towards the Research England Development Fund. So this is a significant um, part of UKRI, uh, the UK Research and Innovation, um, which commits up to seven, 27 million in, the, in annual funding, uh, focused on supporting projects aiding uh, development and attraction of higher education research a knowledge exchange, obviously with commercial partners, in line with both government and UKRI priorities. And this was happening at a time where there were a lot of initiatives occurring both nationally and internationally in terms of recognition of the importance uh, of open research. Um, the UK government released an R&D roadmap just over a year ago, uh, highlighting the need for um, openness in research, uh, you, know, uh, you know, skills training, digital skills training. You know, it's not just HGV drivers that the UK is currently short of, it's uh, people who've got sort of digital skills that sort of play a critical role in research teams. Um, again, the same sort of line which was highlighted in the most recent uh, R&D people and culture strategy, really saying, you know, this needs to be, this, this is needed to kind of upskill uh, the, the research workforce within the UK. We need to provide these, uh, these skills and, and support um, internationally, uh, as I'm sure you're aware of, there are a number of uh, G7 um, position statements released. I know Carol was centrally involved uh, in, in this kind of work. So there was the original Open Science Working Group's position, uh, the most recent declaration on COVID-19, which covers openness and transparency, the research compact, uh, and then the recent UNESCO Open Science recommendations too. So in that context, we developed a project uh, to be submitted to Research England, growing and embedding research culture, open research and institutional practice and culture. Uh, three work streams. First one very much focused on providing that kind of training environment to give uh, you know, our researchers the kind of skills they needed to engage in open uh, uh, research. Um, this is going to involve a lot of engaging with uh, communities. We kind of want to reach those 
bits of the um, academic landscape that currently aren't really, you know, to uh, to to engage with this kind of stuff. Um, really trying to understand what research transparency means across disciplines. The last thing the UKRN wants to do is to come in and tell anybody how, sh how they should be doing the research in, in a transparent manner. So this is very much about working with communities to understand what research transparency means to them. I think engaging the early career researchers is key. Uh, and then we've got work streams on evaluating how successful the training has been um, and sharing best practice. Uh, and borrowing a phrase from Simon Hetrick and the SSI, or it could be a phrase from Neil, uh, projects based on a model of collaboration, not competition. So there are about 20 uh, uh, partners. Um, we start with a tweet. Um, it's nice then that the funding was announced by a tweet effectively. Um, the project uh, is worth 8.5 million over five years and Research England have given us 4.5 million. And it was a bit of a sort of who wants to be a millionaire uh, type interaction at the interview um, that Mar Marcus was at, where originally we asked for 4 million, uh, Research England came back and said, we don't want to give you 4 million, we want to give you more than that. Um, so they, they contributed uh, an additional half million to the project, which I think works out about 17 or 18% of their uh, annual uh, Research England development fund pot, which uh, I think tells you something. The funds will support uh, overheads for the institutional leads across the 18 institutions for five years. A number of um, posts, the 18 posts, uh, costed at grade four level, which institutions are basically combining with other pots of funding to make uh, sort of more substantial posts at higher grades with uh, those funded by the projects. Some will sit in libraries, some will sit in computer science, some in research IT. Um, I'm aware I'm kind of getting a bit short in time here, so I'm going to skip on to something else we've just been recently working on. Um, those in the UK might have uh, heard that the uh, Science and Technology Committee in the UK uh, government recently uh, launched an inquiry on uh, reproducibility and research integrity, integrity um, asked for submissions to that inquiry. I was responsible for um, drafting both the UKRN and the University of Manchester responses to the inquiry. Uh, and in both cases, we say this isn't the question of reproducibility or replicability per se. This is actually about transparency in research. And that's something that sort of speaks broadly across all disciplines, not just STEM disciplines. Uh, very much recognizing that uh, the, the way in which people are incentivized has to change, uh, recognizing the team science approach, the incredibly important role of data stewards, uh, research software engineers as part of a research team, uh, encouraging a joined up approach across stakeholders. And one thing the UK is brilliant at um, is having endless meetings and endless consultations. And we made the point very clearly that we wanted to stop this sort of endless dystopian cycle of consultations and actually get the UK government committed to action in this sort of area. Just going to skip through the next couple of slides. You can access them from the slide deck, which uh, I'll send to Shreve after this talk. Um, you know, the, and, and this is going to come out actually, hopefully, in uh, uh, BMC research notes um, as a way of kind of uh, kind of making it clear what the UK and stands for and why we think that it's not just about reproducibility per se, but it's actually about the broader world in which research is conducted, the incentivizations, incentives that are offered to academics. Not surprisingly, people behave in a way that's optimal for the environment in which they work. So if they're incentivized to behave in a certain way, they will. Let's change the intensus and we'll change the behavior. If you're interested in getting involved, uh, if you're in other countries, you might well already have a reproducibility network based on UKRN model. Um, absolutely recommend you contact uh, uh, the networks in your own country. If your country doesn't have a uh, reproducibility network, uh, why not Why not start one? Um, there's lots of UKRN support for helping with that. Finally, you can sign up to the UKRN uh, email list. Uh, you can contact me via email or Twitter. Um, thanks very much. <laughs>